Good morning or afternoon or whenever you are listening to this particular thing. My name is Mr McDermott, welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, so last week, or in the future, nebulous future, whenever it was, I released the first video on this, I did a rambling revision session on a Christmas carol. Now, I wouldn't say that it necessarily went viral, more tiny tickly cough than full-blown Covid, but there seemed to be a few people who were interested in watching the video, and some of my lovely Year 11 class even fed back and said it was tolerable, which I'll take as a win. Um, so here is part two, um, or stave two, of A Christmas Carol. Um, still not really worked out this whole introduction-y thing, but, you know, I'm old, so never mind. Today, um, similar kind of thing, I'm going to provide a summary and analysis of stave two of A Christmas Carol, then I shall read through the stave, delighting you, audience, listener, my no doubt cringing year 11 class at the moment, with an amazing array of vocal talent, um, and I will stop and start and point out bits of analysis, so it would be incredibly useful if you had a pen and paper, or a phone and notes, or something with which to write this down because when you are revising do something with the work please don't just sit there listening like a insert simile of choice so without further ado and literally with no ado or further <clears throat> um, i'm just going to summarize the stave and crack on so scrooge has woken up in the middle of the night feeling very confused about the time um, he recalls Marley's ghostly warning that the first of three spirits will visit at one o'clock and an eerie figure, which turns out to be the ghost of Christmas past, appears at the appointed hour. This spirit has a childlike appearance but exudes wisdom and experience, hiding its glowing head with a cap. It instructs Scrooge to accompany it on a journey. With a touch to Scrooge's heart, the spirit grants him the ability to fly, quite handy, and they exit through the window. They travel to the countryside of Scrooge's childhood, where he sees his old school friends. I say friends, they kind of ignored him and buggered off for Christmas. And familiar places. These memories move Scrooge to tears. The spirit takes him uh, to a lonely Christmas from his past. When he was a boy, and he was left alone at school. Then they visit more Christmases, watching as the young Scrooge's life unfolds, and he remains a sad, lonely old kid in the corner. Again, please don't write that down. Eventually, Scrooge's sister uh, arrives to take him home, and their father is a little bit kinder rather than being a massive turd to him. Um, Scrooge informs the spirit that his sister passed away many years ago and is the mother of his nephew Fred. Um, the journey continues with visits to a festive party held by Fezziwig, Scrooge's former employer, and a glimpse of Scrooge's younger self who is in love with a woman named Belle. Belle breaks off their engagement due to Scrooge's growing greed, and the spirit shows Scrooge a more recent scene where Belle, now married, reminisces about her past love for Scrooge, who is now alone in the world. Overwhelmed, Scrooge begs to return home, and in his desperation he covers the spirit's head with its cap, ending the visions. Uh, I say cap, I don't mean like one of those snapbacky things, I mean like a metal cap that you would use to put out a candle. Um, Scrooge finds himself back in his bedroom where he quickly falls asleep. Um, so a bit more analysis here. Um, in this allegorical tale, um, the ghost of Christmas past symbolises memory. The aged appearance of this childlike figure emphasises the role in connecting different phases of your life, while its glowing head signifies the illuminating power of the mind. The ghost kickstarts Scrooge's transformation. I mean, you could argue that actually Marley had done that, but hey-ho. Uh, transformation from a Christmas-hating miser to a symbol of holiday cheer. Each memory reveals a younger Scrooge who possesses some capacity for love and connection with others. As Scrooge witnesses his own descent into cold-hearted greed, aka being a git, the memories force him to confront his emotional past. These vivid recollections melt his icy exterior, setting the stage for transformation. Again, if you remember nothing else from anything that I say, remember that this novel is essentially a journey. This is all about Scrooge's redemption and salvation. Remember that, Scrooge's redemption and salvation. Whatever question you get, whatever they ask you, Scrooge is the only thing present in pretty much every page of the book. So always link it back to Scrooge and his redemptive arc. Um, a significant aspect of A Christmas Carol is its portrayal as Christmas as kind of this joyful holiday rather than this holy holiday. And the story promotes values like universal brotherhood. Sorry, I'm not being sexist here or misogynist or anything like that. I'm talking in Victorian terms, so please don't, like, I, th I think it's called cancel me. I'm, I'm, anyway, um, this idea of communal goodwill, festive celebration, and it emphasises that possessing wealth um, is not inherently wrong what matters is what you do with that wealth and it's not about the pursuit of um, material pleasure or garnering all this wealth or garnering all this money it's about spreading joy and sharing and being part of that um, that brotherhood of man if you like um, Dickens so 
Dickens uses several characters here, especially Fezziwig, as a binary opposite, as a, as a juxtaposition, as the antithesis of Scrooge, to reveal how awful a human being Scrooge has eventually descended into being. Anyway, moving on with stave two, um, commence dramatic reading, and the annoying pauses and breaks say, sort of, talk about the language, etc. So, stave two, the first of three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of the bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavouring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes when the chimes of a neighbouring church struck the four quarters. So he listened for the hour. Notice here, we've gone from Scrooge liking darkness because it's cheap to actually beginning to fear it. So we're starting to see those transitions already. His attitude towards darkness has changed. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went on from six to seven and from seven to eight and regularly up to twelve and then stopped. Twelve. It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong and Icicle must have got into the works. Twelve. He touched the spring of his repeater, that's a kind of watch, to correct the most preposterous clock. Its rapid little pulse beat twelve and stopped. Why, it isn't possible, said Scrooge. That I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything has happened to the sun, and this is twelve noon. The idea being an alarm... alarm oh, good job I'm not editing this. I don't sound like a complete twit. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything. And he could see very little then. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold. And again, just, just tacking in here, this idea of fog, this inability to hear, the setting of pathetic fallacy, this sense of mystery. And remember, even though this is a Christmas story, it is still kind of a gothic, almost horror-esque story. So there are those elements of isolation and loneliness and fear. And there was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten off bright day and taken possession of the world. And this was a great relief because three days after sight of the first exchange, pay Mr Ebenezer Scrooge or his order and so forth would have become a mere United States security if there were no days to count by. Scrooge went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was. And the more he endeavoured not to think, the more he thought. So again, this man who is inherently sensible, is inherently analytical, is driven by numbers rather than people, is now doubting himself. Marley's ghost had bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again like a strong spring released to its first position, and presented the same problem to be worked through. Was it a dream or not? And again... This idea of doubt is creeping in. Was there something wrong? Was it more a blob of mustard? Was it actually a ghost story? Because if it's not, Scrooge is going to maintain this idea of being so against his fellow man. Scrooge lay in this state until the chime had gone three quarters more, when he remembered on a sudden that the ghost had warned him to the visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to lie awake till the hour was past, and considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven... This was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. Subtle not there, of course, he can't go to heaven yet. He is too, he is bound by these chains. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length, it broke upon his listening ear. Ding dong, a quarter past, said Scrooge, counting. Ding dong, half past, said Scrooge. Ding dong. The hour itself, said Scrooge triumphantly, and nothing else. And here we have an exclamation mark, a note of excitement. Scrooge here is not berating anyone. He is not angry at anyone. This is pure relief and emotion that we have not seen in Scrooge yet. Again, indicative of that change, perhaps. He spoke before the hour bell sounded, which now it did with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside. I tell you by a hand, not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them as close to it as I am now to you, and I am standing in the spirit of your elbow. So again, here... Four poster bed, curtains drawn round, the only one's moving, and we know Scrooge is alone because he's a lonely old sinner. 
is the one directly facing him, so the one that he has full view of. It was a strange figure, like a child yet, not so like a child as like an old man viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle on it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same as if it were to hold of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were like those upper members bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white and round its waist had a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful, it held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in a singular contradiction of that wintry emblem had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was, that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light, by which all was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held in its arm. So here we have this interesting dichotomy of description, Something to note here, the ghost of Christmas past is kind of indefinable. There's sort of lots of contradictions about it compared to the certainty of the ghost of Christmas present, which is described in florid detail and remains stable, uh, whereas compared to the ghost of Christmas yet to come, which is kind of a hooded figure that we can't see a lot about. And that kind of is indicative of the way we experience time. So in the past, this kind of we remember things incompletely or we remember things differently or that changes over time which is indicative of that particular spirit in the present we are there we can see everything we experience things and we recognize them for what they are and the future of course being shrouded and mysterious that we is unknown hence why we never see its face but here is that mutable changing aspect which is going to feed into scrooge and feed into this idea that he he doesn't remember his past until he's brought before before him even this, though when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For as its belt sparkled and glittered now in one part and now in another, and what was light one instant at another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm and now with one leg, and now with twenty legs and a pair of legs without a head, and now a head without a body of which dissolving parts no outline would ever be visible in the dense gloom wherein it melted away. And then the very wonder of this, it would be itself again distinct and clear as ever, are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if instead of being so close beside him it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past, inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish stature. No, your past. Perhaps Scrooge could not have told anybody why, if anybody could have asked him, but he had a special desire to see the spirit in his cap, and begged him to be covered. <laughs> what? exclaimed the ghost. Would you so soon put out with worldly hands the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those who passions made this cap, and forced me through the whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow? So this idea that... This cap hides the light, and of course light is indicative of metaphor, symbolic of truth, and Scrooge is hiding that truth, and it's a critique here of actually, why are we hiding things away? Why is mankind, particularly the bad elements of mankind, the greedy elements of mankind, hiding away the true nature of what's brought them there? Scrooge reverently disclaimed all intention to offend, or any knowledge of having willfully bonneted the spirit at any period of his life. He then made bold to inquire what business brought him here. Your welfare, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but he could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would be more conducive in that end. Again, trying to barter his way out of its sarcasm, not facing up to the situation. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately, Your reclamation, then, take heed. It put out its strong hand as it spoke, and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, the bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing, that he was clad but lightly in his slippers and dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped his road in supplication. Notice here, the time at which Scrooge is being taken. It is night time, he is in his night clothes, he is vulnerable, he is not properly dressed. All of this leaves him open to the world in a way which he has not been before. I mean, obviously it looked like a bit of a lunatic if he was wandering down the street in his dressing gown, but this is that real indicative description of beauty of Dickens, that he's, he's subtly lining and foreshadowing this for us. But uh, I am mortal, Scrooge remonstrated, and, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand, there, said the spirit, laying its hand upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. 
As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished, not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear cold winter day with snow upon the ground. Notice here, really, really clever. There is an absolute delineation, an absolute separation. We've gone from the city to a rural area. We've gone from fog to clarity. We've gone from night to daytime. We This this dichotomy, posh word, meaning juxtaposition here, that, that Dickens uses is to emphasise that change and difference, and you will notice the immediate difference upon Scrooge. Good, good heaven! said Scrooge, clasping his hands together and looked about him. I, I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. And again, exclamations in the way that he is talking, and here it is with excitement and potentially joy. An um, emotion that we have not seen at all within Scrooge. The spirit gazed upon him mildly. Its gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odours floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long... Long forgotten. Really clever here. That that evocative sense of smell. And if you've never experienced that, I guarantee you will when you get older. Like what I is. Sorry, terrible English there. When you smell something from your childhood, it immediately opens up so many senses and can like flood you. It's quite overwhelming sometimes. Back to that time. And that's exactly what Scrooge has gone, gone to. Your lip is trembling, said the ghost. And what is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered with an unusual catching in his voice. And again, hear the emotion, the catching in his voice that it was a pimple, and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. Uh, you recollect the way, inquired the spirit. <laughs> Remember it, cried Scrooge with fervour. I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognising every gate and post and tree. Notes that every tiny detail, that beautiful little list there. Gate, post, tree. Scrooge knows it. Until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs, who called to the boys in country gigs and park cart and carts driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad field was so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. The jocund travellers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named every one. Why he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them. Why did his cold eyes glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at the crossroads and the byways for their several homes? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon a Merry Christmas! What good had it ever done him? Really, really clever here. Really clever, and I want you to think about this. These are the boys going home for the holidays. They are excited. They are singing. They are bidding their Merry Christmas and goodbyes. And who can't interact with them? It's a rhetorical question there, because clearly it's Scrooge. Scrooge here is visiting in the past. There are shades of things that have gone before, and he cannot interact with them. Just as a boy, he was left in the school by them. And he could not interact with them there either. So he's being left for a second time. Almost. It's reinforcing that idea of isolation. Remember, solitary is an oyster in stave one. We are still there with Scrooge. The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Now... This reoccurring image comes again, and in Scrooge, in the opening, he is imprisoned by his chains. Here he is imprisoned by these four walls. He's isolated and alone. Scrooge said he knew it, and he sobbed. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little weathercock, I know, hilarious word, surmounted cupola on the roof and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes, for the spacious offices were little used, their walls were damp and mossy, their windows broken and their gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables and the coach houses and sheds were run over with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within, for entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them some poorly furnished, cold and vast. There was an earthy savour in the air, and a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight and not too much to eat. Contextual moment here. Remember, you know, this is a school that he's gone to, it's probably being paid for, but it's not one of the best private schools in the world. It's clearly a little bit run down. It's clearly stricken by elements of poverty, which links back to Dickens' own experience of childhood. Remember, where he, he was he'd been subject to poverty and, and he'd been in the work he'd been well not workhouses, but he'd had to work from a very, very young age. Father was incredibly poor. So perhaps ringing on his own childhood experiences here. 
Not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle for the mice behind the paling, not a drip from the half-thawed water spout in the dull yard behind, not a sigh among the leafless boughs of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not a clicking in the fire, but fell upon the heart of Scrooge with softening influence and gave a freer passage from his tears. The spirit touched him on the arm. Oh, scroll through that. As the spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self intent upon reading. Suddenly, a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt and leading by the bridle an ass laden with wood. Please behave yourself, so that means donkey. Why, it's Ali Barber, Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. It's dear old honest Ali Barber. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time. Just like that, poor boy, and Valentine, says Scrooge. And his wild brother Orson, there they go. And what's his name? He was put down in his drawers asleep at the gate of Damascus. Don't you see him? And the Sultan's groom turned upside down by the genie. And here he is upon his head, serving right. I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? To hear Scrooge expanding all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects in most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying, and to see his heightened and excited face would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. And uh, there's the parrot, cried Scrooge. Green body and yellow tail with a thing like a lettuce growing out of the top of his head. Oh, there he is. Poor Robin Crusoe. He called him when he came home again after sailing round the island. Poor Robinson Crusoe. Where have you been, Robinson Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was a parrot, you know. There goes Friday running for his life to the little creek. Hello, uh, whoop, hello. Then, with a rapidity of transition very foreign to his usual character, he said in pity for his former self, Poor boy, and cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him after drying his eyes off with a scuff. But it's too late now. And there's the irony there, because it's not too late. He can't change what's happened in the past, but he can change what's going to happen in the future. What's the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I, I should like to have given him something, that's all. No, there, right there. There is the beginning of the vestiges of those ideas of, tra of not tragedy, sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong thing, of charity, rather. Okay, charity's coming through there. You know, the guy that he chased off because he was being a douchebag in it, sorry, don't put that, being a uh, miser uh, in stave one. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and naked lathes were shown instead. But how all this was brought about when Scrooge no knew more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct that everything had happened so that there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. Notice here, even his surroundings are decaying, becoming more corrupted, just as Scrooge, as he gets older, becomes more corrupted by greed. Ooh, I like the way it said greed there. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost with a mournful shaking of his head and glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened. And a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him and addressed him as, Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child, clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh. To bring you home? Home? Uh, home, little fan, returned the boy. Yes, said the child, brimful of child, brimful of glee. Home, for good and all, home for ever and ever. Father is much kinder than he used to be. That home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not unafraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes, and are never to come back here. But first we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. You are quite the woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy, noted here. The absolute delight and joy and just goodness of this character, this this kind of this kind of oh, I'm gonna describe her as a as a McDonald's item, this little nugget of joy that comes into his life that is going to unfortunately be struck absent. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness towards the door, and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, uh, Bring down Master Scrooge's box there! And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with ferocious condescension and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. He then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best parlour that was ever seen where the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the window were waxy with cold. Here he produced a decanter of curiously light wine, 
and a block of curiously heavy cake, and administered instalments of those dainties to the young people at the same time, sending out a meagre servant to offer a glass of something to the postboy, who answered that he thanked the gentleman, but if it was the same tap he had tasted before, he had rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk being tied down um, to the top of the chaise, so that chase... The children bade the schoolmaster good night right willingly, and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep. The quick wheel was dashing the hoar frost and snow from the dark leaves of the evergreen like a spray. So notice that we have this really odd interaction. So that the, the teacher there is kind of belligerently kind of bestowing some kind of festivity by offering a seasonal glass of wine, um, but he's so tight and the wine's so crap that you know this postboy, who's probably not got a great deal, has gone. Nah, I'm all right, thank you. Right, sorry, quick drink. Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost, but she had a large heart. So she had, cries Grease. Ah, you're right. I will not gainsay it, spirit, God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children. One child, Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost, your nephew. Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind and answered briefly, yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfare of a city where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled their way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing... Sorry, I have lost my way slightly. Ah, there we are. Sorry. Uh, da -da -da -da. Dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time again. But it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew of it. Know it? said Scrooge. W was I apprenticed here? They went in at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement. W why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked at the clock which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands and adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, that's a terrible description, but I might, and called out comfortably in a comfortably rich, oily, fat, jovial voice, Oh, ho there, Ebenezer, dick! So now, again, we have this character, larger than life, fat compared to Scrooge's thinness, joyous, excitable, and generous. So here we could see what Scrooge might have become. Um... Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, there he is. He's very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried the old Fezziwig with a sharp clap of his hands before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three, had them up in their places. Four, five, six, barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hee-ho, cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with a wonderful legitimacy. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room in here. Hee-ho, Dick, cheer up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. And again, not out of fear. Not out of anything, a desire to please this jovial man. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire. Ha 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 my favourite symbolism here. Talked about it before. Look at this idea of fire and light and warmth when it's Fezziwig, fuel was heaped upon the fire. And this huge flame arises, and we've got hope and joy compared to Ebenezer being like this single little spark of coal. And the warehouse was snug and warm and dry and bright, a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came six young fellows whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way who was suspected of having not bored enough from his master. And soon, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling, in they all came. Notice here, the description is of everyone. And we have that exact opposite description where we talk about people interacting with Scrooge in Safe One where it is deliberately saying that literally every single person who has a heartbeat ignores Scrooge and here everyone is surrounded and is brought together by Fezziwig and his generosity 
Gordon from his restaurant home, trying to hide himself behind the girl next door, but one, who was proved to have had ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after another. Uh, we've done that bit, sorry. Uh, so push and pull it out. Anyhow and every how, away they all went. Twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again, the other way, down the middle, up again, round and round, at various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place. New top couple starting off again as soon as they got there. All top couples at last. And not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially provided for the purpose. But scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again. Though there were no dancers yet as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter, and there were brand new men resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dances, there were more forfeits, more dances, there was cake and there was negus and there were great pieces of cold roast and there were great pieces of cold boiled and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled and when the fiddler, an artful dog mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told him, struck up the Sir Roger de Coverley, then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple two, with a good stiff piece of work cut for them. Three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. Notice here the description of food, right? We have just a huge array of a feast, a, a sense of sharing, a certain, you know... When we say hot roast and we say cold boiled, we are talking about meat. Meat is expensive, meat is desirable, and we have Scrooge sitting there with a slight head cold eating thin gruel like Oliver Twist. Couldn't be any further away than he is from Fezziwig. But if they had twice as many, after four times old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had all gone through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle and back again. Your place, Fezziwig, cut. Cut so deftly that he appeared to wink on his legs and came upon his feet without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven... This domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations on either side of the door, shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out. Equality. No sense of um, hierarchy here. It's just people. And wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two princes, they did the same to them. And thus cheerful voices died away. And the lads were left to their beds, which were under the counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene with, and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost, and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon its head burnt very clear. Nice little description there. Light burning clear, saying everything. Scrooge is reliving this memory and taking the joy from it. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Notice that there, this immense, immense sarcasm here. The ghost pointing out the things that are wrong with the way Scrooge treats the world. Scrooge, basically, going back to this idea that people are overspending at Christmas, why the hell would you do it? Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two princes who were pouring their hearts in praise of Fezziwig and what he had done. So sad. Why is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? As the ghost is pointing out here, listen, listen, listen. He's only spent a tiny bit. Why does he get this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark. Angry that he could say such a thing. And speaking unconsciously like his former self, not his latter self. Speaking like when he wasn't completely corrupted. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome. A pleasure or a toil say that his power lies in words and looks in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. And that's the point. And that is the point. That actually the way that Fezziwig inhabits the world and makes other people's lives a pleasure, a joy is within the power of everyone. It's almost a subtle nod from Dickens here, saying, 
don't be an asshole. I can't say that, can I? Don't, don't be a terrible person. He felt this... Sorry. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What's the matter? Asked the ghost. Nothing particular. Something, I think. No, said Scrooge. No, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That is all. And again, second part, speak to his clerk. Speak to the guy that he treats like an idiot. Think a kind word to make his life not quite so miserable. His former self turned down the lamps and gave a quick utterance to the wish. And Scrooge and the ghost stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit quick. This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man, in the prime of his life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Avarice is linked to greed, by the way, so we know there's something not quite right. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye. Look there, eager, greedy, restless. Again, subtle nods, but they are there, which showed the passion that had taken root and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly. To you very little. Another idol has displaced me. Whoa, stop, get a pen. Another idol has displaced me. Religious connotations. Thou shalt not worship false idols. The false idol in this case is money. And she's pointing out that that this sin has grown and taken root within Scrooge. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, I would have tried to do. I have no just cause to grieve. <laughs> what idol has displaced you? He rejoined, a golden one. That is really powerful. That is really worth noting. That the woman he loved, or thought he loved, realises that she is not as important as the money that he thinks he's going to earn. This is an even-handing dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. He's trying to justify his actions here. He's like, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm trying not to be poor here. Surely that's a good thing. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you, have I not? Pointing out here that actually all the good that was in him is, is sloughed off, it's gone, it's disappearing. He is now driven by this, this monster. What then? He retorted. Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. Listen. The way she talks about it now, it's in terms of business, and actually marriage was con is, is a contractual obligation. right? And a promise of marriage is, it was, was able to be upheld in a court of law. And listen to how she releases him from his contractual obligation. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed when it was made. You were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently, suggesting perhaps that, that you know, not even suggesting, really, really pushing forward that, that love is naive and boy-like and stupid and it's actually money that is important. Your own feeling tells you that you are not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and keenly I have thought of this. I will not say... It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No. Never. So she knows. She knows what he really feels. In what, then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly but with steadiness upon him. Tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? <laughs> no. He seemed to yield at the justice of his supposition in spite of himself, but he said with a struggle, you think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows, when I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday... Can I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in your very confidence with her weigh everything by gain, 
interesting that the word gain there is capitalised, making sort of personifying the idea. Or choosing her for a moment, you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so. Do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may, the memory of what is past half makes me hope you will have a pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened that you were awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him and they parted. Oh, oh, God, oh. Do you know what? The truth hurts. The truth really hurts. Scrooge has picked this life, thinks it'll make him happy, and she goes. And she, she, she does it out weirdly out of love for him, not selfishness for her. She knows that actually he would be happier without her. And that must be, oh, ooh, I tell you what. Spirit, says Scrooge, show me no more, conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more, says Scrooge, no more, I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. Cannot face the truth, but the relentless ghost pinioned him in both arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like the last that Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her, now a comely matron, now a mother. She's now a mum. She's now got the family she wanted living her, I think you would say, hashtag best life or equivalent, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous for their... Apologies for the motorbike I assume going past right now totally distracted me there so uh, so beautiful and so, da, 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 Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count and unlike the celebrated herd in the poem there were not 40 children conducting themselves like one but every child conducting itself like 40 the consequences were uproarious beyond belief but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much, and the latter, soon beginning to mingle into sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What I would not have given to be one of them, though I never could have been so rude. No, no, I wouldn't, for the wealth of all the world, have crushed that braided hair, torn it down for the precious little shoe I wouldn't have plucked it off. God bless my soul that saved my life. As to measuring her waist in sport, as they did, bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown round it for punishment, and never come straight again. And yet I should dearly liked, I own, to have touched her lips, to question her that she might have opened them, to look upon the lashes of her downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair an inch of which would be a keepsake beyond price. In short, I should have liked, I do confess, to have had the lightest license of a child, and yet been man enough to know its value. So just the simple pleasures of being a family, of running around, of enjoying each other and life, the thing that Scrooge cannot have now, or thinks he cannot have. But now a knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued that she, with laughing face and plundered dress, was borne towards the centre of a flushed, boisterous group, just in time to greet the father who came home attached by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and struggling and the onslaught that was made on his defenceless porter, the scaling him with chairs for ladders to dive in his pockets, to spoil him of brown paper parcel to hold on tight by his cravat, hug him round his neck, pommel his back, and kick his legs to an irrepressible affection. The shouts of wonder and delight of which the development of every package was received, the terrible announcement that the baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan in his mouth and was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden platter, the immense relief of finding this a false alarm. The joy and gratitude and ecstasy, they are all indescribable alike, and it is enough that by degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlour and one by one stare at a time. Try that again. Their emotions and got out of the parlour and by one stare at a time up to the top of the house, where they went to bed and so subsided. Are you ready for something a little bit deep? Good. <clears throat> and now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever. When the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside, and when he thought that such a creature quite as graceful and full of promise might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. He sees what he could have had. A family, a thing that would have kept him rich, a thing that was much richer than all the money that he has collated in his life, tabulated, taken, squeezed out of people. Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. 
how can I... T I don't know. She added in the same breath, laughing, as he left. <laughs> Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not quite shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death. I hear, and there he is, sat alone. Quite alone. In all the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you, these were the shadows of things that have been, said the ghost, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. It is time to face up, Scrooge. You cannot change what has happened. These are the things that need to be illuminated. Hence why the light of the ghost of Christmas passed. It is shining a light on the truth on what has happened. These things define and shape us, and Scrooge cannot accept that. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which some strange way there were fragments of all the faces that had shown him wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if that can be called a struggle in which the ghost had no visible resistance upon its own part, undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap by a sudden action and pressed it down upon his head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form, but though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood to the ground. He cannot, which none of us can do, escape the past. We are bound to it, driven by it, and must learn from it, or we are doomed, or at least I suppose that's what Dickens is trying to say. He was conscious of it being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. So we finish the stave with Scrooge falling asleep again. There is so much to unpick across all of this, and, and, and we see Scrooge descend into this corrupted being who is hateful towards his fellow man who sits alone and notice we've got that dichotomy again at the end we've got this scene where there's this yes it's, it's it's a set of rooms that aren't terribly well furnished but are full of life and vitality and warmth and light and then we see scrooge partner dying not even with his partner who's dying lit by one solitary candle this sort of ethereal flame and we get the ghost of christmas past light which scrooge has not managed to put out but falls asleep with it streaming into his room he is he is now, I don't know if tainted is the right word, but illuminated by this light. And remember those symbolic things of light and the semantic field of truth. And please remember, again, this final thing, that this is that Scrooge's redemptive arc, and that has started. He has looked to the poor sod that sang God Rest You Mary Gentleman that he basically told to sod off, thinking about his clerk and thinking about the ways that he could have been, what could have happened, and that hasn't happened. And the fact that he's angry by this shows that he is beginning to lose perhaps perhaps the financial word is beginning to lose the primacy in his life there are other things that he is now aware of i really hope that's been useful in some respect um i suppose the sign-off bit i need to work on i have been mr mcdermott i hope i continue to be i don't plan to shuffle off this mortal coil just yet if you have enjoyed this please like and subscribe or not i really don't give a toss um but if there is anything that you want to know, any questions, please do leave them in the comments. And I promise I will get back to you with a sensible rather than sarcastic answer. Thank you very much for your time. Um, have a wonderful whatever it is you teenagery people do when you've finished revising. Um, and you shall hear from me again for stave three, I suppose. <laughs>